Welcome back to the Morning Brew. Jasmine Ventor sitting in uh, a little bit for uh, Natalie Lagore and Akash Samaru. Uh, we're putting the spotlight in this segment on the issue of domestic and gender-based violence in Trinidad and Tobago. As you are aware, we've had a couple instances already. The new year is 12 days old, and we're seeing it rearing its ugly head, uh, women being attacked, and in one instance, a woman losing her life. Uh, to put some perspective on that, we've got um, the uh, director at the Coalition Against Domestic Violence, Roberta Clark. Uh, good morning to you, Roberta Clark. Good morning, Jetsumi. It's so good to see you, and thank you for having us on your program. And uh, just to put things in perspective, I just want to um, let everyone know that um, Roberta Clark has been, um, you know, carrying a huge mantle on her shoulders for several years as the uh, director of UN Women. She used to be based in Barbados um, and, and had a perspective on the Caribbean. And now you're based uh, where exactly, Roberta? Well, I, I'm associated with the office in Eastern Southern Africa, but right now I'm telecommuting from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, okay, okay. So you've got a, a really a, a global perspective on this whole issue of domestic and gender-based violence. Um, we've had the authorities seeing things like we've put legislative procedures in place, we're moving to increase the number of shelters. Uh, only yesterday, uh, the Ministry of Social Development uh, issued a statement saying that they're going to be ramping up their programs that will be targeting men specifically so that so that men aren't left out in this because there is a tendency to assume that gender-based violence is only about women but that's not the case is it no it's it's definitely not the case but it's also the reality that all over the world and here in Trinidad and Tobago the majority of victims are women because of, there is a you know the, the cause of gender-based violence is connected to unequal relationships between women and men and there's a clear correlation in societies where women don't experience equality, where they are not equally valued, where men consider that they need to be in control and need to be the head. Patriarchal societies that you have also high incidences of uh, violence, domestic violence, all forms of violence, including sexual assault. So yes, men are also victims, but there is also a, a pattern which is connected to inequalities between women and men. The thing is, though, men would say, but how can you how can you say that it's it's a man's world is still it's still a patriarchal society when women are making so many strides, uh, women are becoming even more educated than than many of the men in their societies. Uh, they're heading up um, huge businesses. They're running their own small businesses. It, it's not a man's world anymore. A man can't even look at a woman right without um, you know being accused of sexual harassment. So so you can't you can't accuse you know men of of, of um, wanting to be in charge or dominant, you know, that kind of, of, of talk. How do you respond to that? Well, I mean, we don't want to deny that we've made a lot of progress in trying to um, eliminate discrimination against women um, and girls in all societies, but we are not there yet. And in Trinidad and Tobago, as in the Caribbean, as in the world, we have clear indicators of inequality. So, of course, although girls are accessing education and achieving, these, these, uh, this attainment has not equally translated into equal opportunities in the workplace. I think Central Bank has done a study in the last many years that shows paying inequality still exists in this country. Women are still being paid less than men um, across the board. And of course, women also have the care burden of children. The, uh, women are not equally represented in parliament, in cabinet, in political parties at the highest level. So we are still seeing uh, forms of discrimination in our societies. And one of the main manifestations of that, of course, is gender-based gender -based violence. I mean, this morning to, in, the, in, the, in the Express newspaper, there's a headline, violent men believe they must be in control of women. Um, and that is a, a study that comes from the Ministry of Social Development, a reflection that comes from the Ministry of Social Development. And I think underlying that sense of, of control is that sense of inequality that we are, we are trying to fight. And we are saying you cannot end gender-based violence without advancing significantly on gender equality in the culture of the country. We have to get to the culture, to the deep roots. 
Let's talk culture then, because um, our culture seems to be very skewed towards men being dominant, men being in charge. Even uh, the religions that uh, to which people subscribe um, has the male as more or less the center of the universe and master of all he surveys. How do you, you know, mount a challenge to such deeply entrenched beliefs? Because it's one thing uh, in the in the social sphere to say that men and women are equal, but then when you come to someone's religion, when you come to their traditional and cultural practices, that's not the message that they're getting. And it can be argued that this is the message that they get, that inequality of man being dominant all the time, they get that literally by suckling at their mother's breasts. Yeah? Well. Uh, not just their mothers, everyone in society. As you see, of course, many people are, are faith-based, live faith-based lives. And across the board, in many, in many faith-based um, traditions, this idea of men as the, men as the head of the household um, permeates religion. So, you know, that's what we talk, that's why we call it patriarchy, the rule of men. Uh, but of course, we know that that can change. Um, and it really means that, you know, faith-based leaders themselves have to embrace equality as a value and, and embrace the, the, their responsibility for promoting respect, for equal relations, for equal empowerment of, of men, women, boys and girls. That has to happen in faith-based institutions. It has to happen in popular culture. It has to happen in, within our families, for sure. Um, one of the things that we, we are also we also know quite clearly that there's a really strong relationship between how we treat children and uh, and how they, they grow up, you know, whether or not they use violence later in life. And that's why women's organizations and child rights organizations in this country have been calling for some clarity on ending corporal punishment against children. Because we do know that the, that the experience of violence as a child, either yourself experiencing it or witnessing it around you, also increases the likelihood that you will be a perpetrator um, or that you yourself will continue to be a victim as an adult. So we also have to address the relations between parents and children and equalize that in the sense of non-violent, non-violent discipline, non-violent treatment, uh, because that's so strongly correlated to violence in society generally. Mm. That's an interesting point that you're bringing up there, that whole aspect of, you know, that conditioning in childhood. Um, we've had um, uh, groups, uh, theater groups, uh, sh doing skits showing that a child growing up seeing their parents in, in these very unhealthy relationships would internalize that message and either go on to be the victim in an unhealthy relationship or the abuser in an unhealthy relationship. Given a reality like that, is it possible? possible to even legislate behavior change to bring an end to this vicious cycle? I mean, what kinds of laws can be put in place? And even if the laws are very punitive, you know, would that not make things even worse? You know, Jesse, it's an excellent question, and law is just one, one, of, one part of the response, but it's an important part because the way in which we understand law, law regulates behavior, and it also promotes values. And in the recent amendment, the domestic violence amendments, which took place in 2020, under the leadership of the Attorney General, um, one of the things that we've, one of the progress that has been made in that, in that new law, that amended law, is that now, if a child uh, witnesses violence, that is also now defined as domestic violence. So you, a child witnessing their, their parent being abused is now, now also constitutes domestic violence. And that's the, the acceptance of the, of the, the evidence that there's a relationship between witnessing and perpetration and what we're trying to do is intervene so that in fact people understand that it is a that it is an offense a civil uh, it can be a crime but it's also certainly a ground for getting a protection order if you know, a child is involved as a witness not just as a, not only as a victim but as a witness of, of domestic violence so your question is is law can law work law can work but it has to work along with other things and the other things that we are talking about is sort of changing the culture and the values and how do we do that we do that within the education system all children go to school so it's actually the, the perfect place to re-socialize to transmit the values of empathy the values of equality the values of respect you have to have it in the education system so we're calling for school-based programs that address the question of domestic violence, but also advance the culture that we're talking about. And if you have schools where there's, there's bullying, where there's 
violence, where children are being treated harshly and being offended and insulted, or even uh, properly punished, how do we end the cycle of violence? So the school system, we think, is a really very big part of um, changing the culture, but also, of course, parenting practice. How do we support parents to do that gender-sensitive parenting, to have other ways of disciplining children beyond violence, verbal violence, or physical violence? We know that changing the culture is important for prevention. So far, I think we've been addressing the response, and that's really important. How do we improve policing? How do we improve access to justice through the court system? How do we improve shelters? But we also now have to scale up on the prevention side. Mm -hmm. uh, this may be a little controversial, but, but I feel that we must also bring in this element because we are looking at the issue of gender and the fate of LGBTQIA plus women. Um, when it comes to domestic violence, when it comes to gender-based violence, it's often overlooked, as, as is the case with men who are victims of uh, domestic violence, gender-based violence. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yes, I mean, it's, it's quite a, it's quite a, I would have say, would say a travesty, but that the Domestic Violence Act does not give equal access to seeking protection orders for all people, for all people. We are saying a sexual orientation, then gender identity. These things are immaterial to the, the, the demand and the entitlement to protection. So that is, you know, a, a big gap that you know, we are still fighting with, that we have to have what we call all-inclusive protection for all persons who experience uh, domestic violence must all have uh, equal access to the remedy. That's something that civil society organizations continue to work on and to grapple and to demand. We are demanding that all-inclusive protection. Mm. Let's go back now to, to the topic in its broadest sense and the reality that many people believe that those who are the victims of domestic and gender-based violence actually look for it. They must have done something to cause this person to lash out at them in this way. It seems a Herculean task to change people's perspectives on this, um, you know, because they're saying, if someone is treating you like this, clearly you like it because you're not leaving. But I've spoken to some folks who've been in those situations, and they're saying, if I leave, where do I go? Um, how do I, you know, who's going to help me build my life back up? Let's talk about that a minute. Yes, I, I think people who find themselves in situations where they're, where, where they're victims of violence often don't know what to do. Um, they, they may not be aware of their rights, they may not be aware of their right to demand protection, they may not know how to access police um, or the courts, or they may go, they may not get sensitive treatment, or they just may be fearful. What we do know about domestic violence victims is that they're most at risk when they attempt to leave or when they leave. And we've seen that in several of the cases of the, of the murders, what we call femicides, last year, where women have been killed or murder, have been murdered when they've left. They've already left. They've taken that brave and courageous step to get to safety. But in fact, it's the time when they are the most, uh, they, they, they are, their harm is, their vulnerability to harm is highest. And, and, you know, we all read the papers, we know that. And women who are in those situations understand the risks that they're facing, and sometimes they just think if they just stay put and stay quiet, the violence will stop. But it does not stop. Uh, but the, the, we cannot be victim blaming. I, I, I think that we should have zero tolerance for victim blaming. Everyone in society has a responsibility to step up and to speak up and help victims in harm's way. And if you know someone who's in, in, in danger, who's experiencing violence, you know, you have to be able to listen to them in, in a non-judgmental way, help them get to services that will take them to safety. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, often women are also with children and they don't know where to go with their children. We need more shelters. Um, you know, we just need more, more services to help people move from situations of harm. And that is a continuing challenge, not only here, but everywhere. How do we have a comprehensive response so that people can actually leave situations of harm and go into safety, not into greater harm? I've been speaking to men about this um, particular phenomenon that we've been seeing um, over the years. And uh, a friend of mine said, he said to me once, he said, Jessime, you know, there is a danger 
when we talk about gender-based and domestic-based and domestic violence, there's a danger to make the man the villain so that eventually every man is seen as a villain. But there are men who would never dream of abusing their wives or girlfriends, who would never dream of abusing their children in the way we see in the headlines. So, so it's a conundrum then. How do we get these, um, for want of a better term, and this is even pejorative, the good men to stand up and speak out against the, the violence and to say to other men, this is not the right way, we have a better way. And how do we get the, the again pejorative, bad men who are, who are steeped in the violence, who are perpetrating the violence, to stop and check themselves and say, you know, this is, I'm not doing the right thing, I need help. It's a catch-22 situation, isn't it, Roberta Clark? You know, we recently, um, the Institute of Gender and Development Studies, they did a, the annual lecture to break the silence. You know that IGDS has been doing this work on mm -hmm. and then uh, child, child abuse, child sexual abuse. And we had a psychotherapist from Grenada who gave the, the feature address, uh, Dr. Hazel Dabrio, and she said something that was quite chilling in how accurate it was. She said, someone always knows there's no bad, domestic violence is not happening in a place where no one knows, someone always knows. So we all have the responsibility to speak up. And similarly, men have the equal responsibility to speak up. If they know men in their, their lives, in their universe, who are perpetrators, they must be able to say, no, you have to stop, and here's how we're gonna help you to get to that place where you are causing no one else harm. I think we talk about violence against women, and when we use that term, we're thinking often of services for women. Uh, who have been experiencing abuse. If we are thinking about the perpetration by men, generally speaking of violence, and in particular domestic violence, it may help us to focus on the kinds of services that men need to stop being violent. And those services are, yes, uh, social and psychological, but they're also legal and, and accountability-based. We need to be able to have a zero tolerance for men perpetrating violence, whether that is physical or that is verbal, whether that is part of the, the culture of the community, you know, the things that you know men say about women in the streets. You know, you're walking just me, you would have had that experience often in your life. Even as a young girl, you're walking in the street and someone is telling you something about your body parts, something they think might be complimentary or pejorative, but it's an invasion because you know, this sense that men have an entitlement to the women's space to speak to them about their bodies. Something is also connected to domestic violence, this idea of control. So, you know, I think we need men, not just as allies, but to take responsibility for uh, talking to other men and for changing that culture where there's an acceptance of the use of violence against uh, women and girls. I think we really need allies. And the truth is, yes, I mean, we have a lot of allies now. A lot of lot more men are speaking out and are championing um, uh, this prevention approach. And certainly within uh, the Coalition Against Domestic Violence, we've had so very many men who have come forward and lent their voices as advocates to the cause. And I think that that's going to continue. And to say, you know, the, the statistic is one in three women uh, uh, experience violence, which means, let's uh, roughly speaking, most men are not not perpetrating violence. You know, yes. let's say sixty, seventy percent of men are not perpetrating violence. So I think we also want to be able to say, but we want a hundred percent of of uh, non-violence of uh, within our society. Roberta Clark, I think that's, that hope-filled um, moment is a good way to, to wrap up our session this morning. And we want to thank you for giving us your time uh, and expertise on this particular topic. And here's hoping that as the year goes on, you have less and less work to do where this is concerned as people become more aware, the collective consciousness develops that gender-based violence, regardless of who the perpetrator is, is wrong and it needs to end. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity. We need a whole of society approach to this, a comprehensive approach, and that's our call from the Coalition Against Domestic Violence. All right, thank you so much. President of the Coalition Against Domestic Violence, Roberta Clark, uh, that's it for this segment. We've got to take a quick break, say thanks to a few people, and when we come back, more on The Morning Brew.